to the risk and indeed danger of making decisions and judgments without any normative or ontological guarantees. Sounds exciting. And also rather familiar since the vision offered here with or without appeal to the tragic is comprised of staple figures of post-structuralist thought since its emergence in the late 1960s. These properties are presumed to be wholly absent by definition in the rival views of the good Grigori's names religious faith and transcendental reason. Unfortunately, Grigori's, Grigori's characterization of these goods is either one-dimensional or caricatured. Whatever one may think of the Christian faith, it does not reduce to or is best exemplified by American right-wing evangelicals. Martin Luther King and Bishop Romero would be more difficult cases to parody than Antonin Scalia. I am by no means, no surprise, persuaded by the account of the secular or secularism offered by Professor Grigoris. It strikes me as sociologically thin and conceptually under complex. The concepts of the secular, of secularism, and secularization are related, but they are also distinct concepts, the meaning of each of which is itself highly contested and indeed unavoidably contestable and contextual. Nonetheless, in the ongoing present debates on secularity, secularism, and secularization, they have been developed by a number of theorists and social scientists to a level of complexity and nuance that is missing from Professor Grigoris's application of them. Moreover, something is at stake in these debates that is also absent from Professor Grigoris's account. And that is the question which underlies and drives these debates to begin with. How are we going to live together? Under what shared understanding of what that would mean when we live in a world of many rival ethical conceptions, a world of deep diversity? Gregorius does not even pose the question, and it is the question, for it is not the case that human plurality is ever going to disappear. The secularism debates have reminded us, once again, of the multiplicity and resiliency of deeply diverse and rival ethical and religious visions, of deeply diverse and rival ways of living and being. As attractive as Gregorius finds the tragic view of life, it is not the only one to which human beings have been drawn or will be drawn. It is but one of many, and those who are drawn to other conceptions will have compelling reasons of their own as to why they prefer theirs to his or to any of the others. How do we speak to, live with, those with whom we profoundly disagree? That's our question. The question of how are we going to live together is thus a normative question, a type of question Grigoris prefers to avoid, but pose it he must if he does not wish to, has, to have his view of the tragic life dismissed as just one more sectarian view out there. So it is not enough, I think, to engage in polemical fashion, engage in these debates in polemical fashion. The atheism he presupposes, excuse me, he espouses sounds to me like a version of negative freedom, responding to the resurgence of religion in the public sphere as a threat to that kind of freedom. Put colloquially, just get out of my face, man. I want to do my own thing here. But perhaps, underline perhaps, uh, exclamation, I've gotten Professor Grigori's completely wrong. And what I've revealed here are not the limitations of his thinking, but of my own. So I would like to conclude with a series of questions that might help dispel any possible confusion. One, Professor Gregorius claims that the tragic view of life, he, uh, his tragic view of life, is against rationality. But he offers arguments, arguments which must meet minimal standards of intelligibility and rationality, which is simply to say that they must be capable of rational persuasion of some kind. Two. He claims, moreover, that his tragic view of life is against morality, but he also claims that we must be concerned, must show compassion, must care for what is human. To my ear, 
these three musts sounds like, sound like they are moral musts, moral obligations of some kind. But why must we? How do we answer this question of why without some normative justification? Three, he claims to be committed to a model of critique for which everything is in principle subject to relentless dismantling and interrogation. But it seems to me that some things are exempt, off limits, untouchable. For example, the tragic view of life he espouses and his brand of atheism, which he described as undeconstructible. Why? Why are they exempt from relentless dismantling and interrogation and secularism and religion or not? In fact, why is this very model of critique not exempt from interrogation? Shouldn't we interrogate the idea of critique as interrogation? Do we really want critique to be aligned with the practice of torture? Fourth, Professor Gregorius claims to reject any appeal to transcendence of any kind, but openness to wonder and to the wondrous sounds like an appeal to transcendence to me, to what lifts us out of our normal routines and experience. There's just two more. Five, he claims to reject certainty, but seems at the same time very certain that the tragic view of life is superior to other views of the good. I'm wondering, did he really decide to believe in the tragic on the basis of ev evidence and reasons, or was he drawn to it as we are drawn to a good? Six, and finally, he claims to prefer discomfort to comfort, but never steps out of the comfort zone of his own convictions and his preferred theoretical vocabulary to engage in the risk-filled attempt of making sense of the convictions of the other, of others, in her or in their own terms, not his. I don't expect Prof Professor Gregorius to answer all these questions. There are others here who have their own questions, probably better than these. And I'll just be satisfied if he answers just the one. Thank you. <laughs> does this work? OK, it does. Well, um, here I um, I will. Wait, 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 be before, before we start, uh, just let me make clear: uh, no other person in the room will be allowed to ask six, six questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I will answer all six questions, <laughs> if only briefly, of course, because because then we would definitely take up our entire time. Um, I mean, some of the questions are unfair. I will actually point that out. But. Um, the first one is, in some ways, a kind of um, a misplaced question, because uh, I, uh, the fact that I'm arguing for a, a poetic uh, encounter with the world does not mean that I am acting irrationally, uh, that I am, I am engaged in a rational argument, because we are in a context of, uh, of, of that kind of conversation, uh, which is, a, that is to say, this is the performative instance uh, that to which I, uh, uh, of course, I have agreed to participate. Hence, I'm conducting a rational argument. I could have written a poem or could have played music. Uh, that would not be the proper performative uh, way of, of, uh, of uh, engaging. So uh, that is, is not a, a, it's a it, it's not a question that I think pertains to the crux of the matter. The second question, um, the musts, the question about musts, is a very important question. Um, and it's one that I'm often, of course, asked. Uh, how can you speak about the uh, lack of norms or, or, or the, uh, the lack of guarantee, normative guarantee, and then proceed, in fact, to make, take positions? And uh, I do think it's the hardest question of all. I mean, I tried to talk about it a bit last time. Um, and I talked about a certain kind of acrobatic way of uh, encountering the world and where one has to make decisions. I'm a skeptic who makes decisions, as I said several times. Uh, and therefore, when one makes decisions, one is, in fact, uh, creating norms of some kind, uh, which uh, one then uh, presumably follows if one does not want to be considered in being consistent. Nowhere, though, do I uh, prescribe these norms to anyone else. I mean, I, um, I consider them to be. Um, 
I'm, they're decisive for me in this particular engagement. This is definitely a polemical piece, this we have to acknowledge, right? The fact that it's a polemical piece does not mean that I'm excluding the opposition. In fact, on the contrary, I must say I've been uh, the object of extreme polemics on the part of those who claimed to be uh, in favor of the equality of all positions and truths, which is a terribly liberal position, a very, very problematic liberal position that actually presumes that critique is neutral and objective, while in fact all critique is always agonistic, always uh, partial, and in that sense always polemical. So, um, but yes, I do acknowledge the, the problem. The problem is, is uh, the, the problem occurs when one steps into the realm of decision and where in fact then uh, some sort of normative structure is, is produced as a result of that. But as I argued last time, if in fact uh, one sense of the context of decision and in fact the whole context of argument or uh, not just argument, but coexistence is provisional, meaning it must always be put to uh, interrogation, then those norms do not uh, achieve some kind of transcendental position that enables them to exist outside of my decision or, or the context. So, so that is definitely something we can talk a great deal about. Um, the third qu question is also not fair in the sense that I've said, I've been saying it constantly, that critique is always self-critique and self-interrogative. So I've never, I never suggest that anything that I said here is dogmatic. I mean, I would not. I mean, that, that's the whole point of being in front of an audience. I expect that I would be questioned for what I'm saying, and that uh, if I falter in not being adequately critical with some of the positions I have taken, this is certainly, first of all, my responsibility. And second, I would welcome anyone to come and say, "Whoa, you know." That is uh, not something that you're being critical, self-critical about. So nowhere am I suggesting that the critical position, the one I'm arguing, atheist or whatever, is beyond question. On the contrary. In fact, I'm, I'm always talking about how provisional it is and how open to question. This leads to the fourth point about transcendence and openness to the other. Um, this is a, a point of contention, obviously. Uh, my uh, argument uh, about being open to the other is precisely so as to avoid the, uh, um, the, um, the domination of a transcendent position. Um, in, in order really to be, um, because the moment that, that um, a position exists outside and has authority in itself, then that otherness, in fact, cannot be encountered. One can only submit to it. The only way that you can really encounter another is as an equal, as an other, an other one of you. Not like you, of course, because that is another. But it cannot be someone who has uh, power over you by, by some sort of, uh, by dictum. Uh, all transcendental positions presuppose uh, that kind of authority, uh, external authority. Now, I said also that imminent positions, meaning positions that don't claim to be uh, self-sufficient entirely, can also run into the same problem. So, uh, so in fact, the difficult, again, in other acrobatics would be uh, that we uh, don't just simply take a position in favor of transcendence or in favor of imminence, etc., but in fact try to uh, uh, break down that kind of uh, differentiation between them. Um, that's a more difficult philosophical point that we can discuss. The fifth point about the superiority of the tragic. Um, I mean, I can see how one can come out with that impression that I'm arguing for the tragic as superior. I'm not arguing for it as something superior. I take it to be a, 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 a way that one can live one's life freely. Of course, it's my uh, uh, um, decision to do that, to engage that kind of mode of, of, of freedom as opposed to the freedom of law or principles or, 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 um, or some kind of system um, that guarantees it. Um, it's an option. It's not uh, by any means uh, superior to any other. Uh, of course, in the polemics of an argument, where one is really obviously um, arguing against uh, and trying to, to uh, take apart some other position, there is the presumption that what you're defending is the good what, you know, and the enemy is bad. Yes, I mean, in a kind of very elementary sense. But that is really performative. There's nowhere in the argument that I'm saying 
that a tragic existence is superior, let's say, to a moral existence or superior to a uh, materialist existence or, or whatever uh, that would be, you know, the love of money. Um, and um, the sixth one, I think, is also a kind of, of, uh, of um, misquestion thing about the comfort zone. I don't think that, um, I think that, the, you know, I, I, this, I told you uh, when I started bef before this, that this is a very unusual paper for me uh, to write. Obviously, I'm, I'm, there's a lot at stake. I'm using the first person a great deal. I'm really taking a great deal of risk in order to be accused of all the things that I'm being accused. So it's hardly uh, the, the, the thing to say that I'm actually in a comfort zone. On the contrary, I think that in, in a way, this is a sort of, a, you know, uncomfortable, discomforting uh, position. And it produces a, a sense of discomfort. I think that uh, I expect that. Um, so I don't consider that to be the first and the sixth question are, are not, they're false questions. The, the other four, are, most of them are important, and I hope that gave some sense. And certainly, I did not do justice to the questions. I mean, that goes without saying. It's too brief of a response. But thank you, really. I appreciate the paper. I'm not sure whether uh, Professor no, Comprivi. Well, maybe uh, someone else from the audience? Please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's try again. Okay, my, one of these mics. Uh, okay. Um, thanks for the lecture and um, for the response. I just want to ask a question. Would you think that organized religion is to religion as organized atheism is to atheism? Okay. I'm not sure. What, what, what is organized atheism, really? I'm, I'm, um, I mean, there are these websites, you know, now. Sort of the atheists unite kind of things. Um, I don't know what we, there is really, really. I, right, right. So, uh huh. Right. I mean, I you see, I'm utterly ignorant of it. I mean, um, so that's a good question. I'm clearly ignorant of it, and I have not thought of it that way at all. It's, I mean, that's my. Uh, I mean, you, you understand that that was my argument against that kind of. Uh, uh, you know, dogmatic atheism that, that is uh, organized in the sense that it, uh, uh, particularly, particularly to the degree that it might seek converts. So that would be, uh, that's t total anathema to me. Um, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and in that respect, that's, that goes for uh, any kind of organized ideological uh, group that seeks converts, okay? Um, so religious practice is not necessarily that. You know, there's a great deal of religious practice that is, in fact, uh, very respectful of, uh, of uh, people around, um, other, people of other beliefs or non-beliefs. But, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the religious practice that isn't that that is of concern to me, uh, the one that tries to establish uh, a realm that everyone must follow. And that is rampant in the world today. No particular religion has, uh, is privy to it. I mean, has... You know, uh, every one of them, well, not almost every one of them, it's a good, very big discussion, but most of them involve at some point or another uh, uh, in, you know, the demand for conversion or a sense of superiority. Um, so I don't, so yes, if it's strictly speaking, it, it would be the same, yes. Uh, that, that's not the atheism I'm espousing. I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I hope that that's clear. Practical mm -hmm. context, for example, I've been recently involved in the Northern Ireland, now in the Middle East. And these are real problems. There are moments when a, 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 an agreement could have been made. Mm -hmm. And the subtleties of, that you've raised tonight in the theoretical discussion would have been enormously valuable. And a lot of the critique would not have been there. Mm -hmm if you'd related the concepts to, you'd applied them to real situations and you had the sort of tantalizing references to the other, mm -hmm. to tolerance. Mm -hmm. So you could be, for example, um, the most extreme um, person in saying, I just don't like 
Jews, I don't like Arabs, and so on. But in a context, for example, if you saw the film A Separation, this says an enormous amount about the flexibility the, of those concepts in practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of the conceptual problems would be clarified and in many cases eliminated if you gave reference to the subtle circumstances that are the characteristic of the modern world. Nothing is more important mm -hmm. than to understand the difference between, I loved your reference to authority, the authority of the transcendental, transcendental and that's a danger. Mm -hmm. And so you make a distinction when you talk about the Muslim faith as to what it's, how it, how it, how it plays itself out in different contexts of greater or lesser tolerance of the other. And I think to talk about that in terms of the other, tolerance of the other in structural terms and also in terms of the power of the arts to move the human spirit to have greater empathy. Sometimes that empathy, which might be natural, is prevented because the structures of authority favour one cast of mind rather than another. No, no, I understand very well what you're saying. I mean, that's the, the nature of this text is such uh, that uh, takes the risk of a, a certain uh, uh, decon decontextualization. And that's deliberate, um, and uh, it 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 uh, succeeds or fails on that basis of this as a strategy. That's not generally true of everything I write, and I certainly um, it depends on the context and the kind of um, um, the kind of stakes. Uh, you know, every every piece of writing. Not, I don't feel that I have to uh, engage with specific examples of the real world in every single thing I write, OK? Uh, I, when I wrote uh, in uh, uh, last year, when I was about the uh, Egypt uh, uprising, um, and when I write also journalism, and I'm very interested in that, it was a whole different kind of writing. I spoke very specifically in what sense I, I, I without, I'm not an expert in the Middle East, OK? But, uh, but uh, in the context, I'm generally interested, though, in, in the assembly movements and in radical democratic action of the last two years or so, all around. So the Egypt thing became part of my general interest in that. But I argued that this was precisely a secular event. Um, why? This had nothing to do with the fact that very devout Muslims were participating. There's no doubt about that. That, in fact, I pointed it out. Um, in order precisely to show that the coexistence or the, uh, the, and the kind of coincidence of action between this incredible range of, 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 uh, of uh, people, of constituencies of action, from uh, radical workers who had been uh, conducting strikes for years and, 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 and of course, being uh, killed you know, repeatedly, they, they were crucial to this event to uh, various groups of women, um, again, women who were either devout Muslims or women who were entirely non-practicing and may perhaps might even be called secular, to students who were involved, in, you know, to people who used the, the internet, all those kinds of things that we heard, to the Muslim Brotherhood. The kind of coincidence of these constituencies in a public space in the way that it was conducted is the perfect example of what would be a secular event. And it was very interesting that I was attacked by various, uh, some of them are friends, uh, because I, uh, I used allegedly a Western categorization. And I found that to be preposterous. I will tell you why. Because uh, first of all, it says that the secular, it belongs to the West. That's the most Orientalist thing that one can say. It means it's as if you know, people who are not Western cannot be secular. That's absurd. Um, the, it was secular, the secular, includes uh, um, the, the devout. It's not, it's not, it doesn't exclude the devout. It just simply understands the devout as one of the many uh, uh, um, practices in a society. Uh, and, and it 
presumably, and that's a very, very big presumably, and has to do with all kinds of legal structures, etc., presumably protects society from any constituency establishing its own dogma over the other. Okay? But I underline the presumably, okay? I understand that this France is a great example of, of the big mess of what that is. So, so, um, so I take your point very seriously, but it is, it is really the nature of this particular, I, I, I please at least indulge me in that, that it's the nature of this particular piece of writing that is not a, a practice I would just say, generally say, well, don't con make connections to the real or to the actual events or to areas of conflict. No, no, obviously, I, I agree with you entirely. Yes, yes, but yes. Yes, yes, but, but this piece is sort of suspended in the midst of a whole bunch of others.